Good evening, all of you. Welcome to Building High Performance Teams, Wellbeing at Work. So for the next 45 minutes time, it's going to be an engaging, exciting journey, probably a short journey, albeit, into the world of Belbin, Belbin team roles, to help us discover something which can make you as individuals perform better and make you help your teams perform better. So building high performance teams, Belbin at work. During this webinar, I might ask you some short questions and I would request you to send in your answers through the chat quickly. And in the last 10 minutes, we can have a quick question answer session. And this entire presentation can be sent to you later after the webinar is over. Thank you and thank you for your time. Thank you for your keenness to learn and welcome to building high performance teams, well-being at work. Interesting question sometimes. Why do some people with high qualifications, why do some people with high qualification actually fail to attain their full potential? Why do some people with high qualifications fail to attain their full potential? I'm sure you must have experienced it in real life. Let's look at one more thing, which is why do some working relationships end up being less productive, bright guys, smart guys, independently good, individually very good, but just put them together, the trouble brews, the trouble begins. The working relationship are no longer productive. The sigma doesn't work. Why do many groups of high performing individuals Perfect guys, super guys, very capable, but when they get together, fail to make the transition to a high-performing team. These are questions which are constantly in our minds. We keep experiencing them in our real life. And these questions pose some big challenges in the way people work in organizations and the way people consequently perform. Let's keep these questions in mind and look at something interesting. You can see the two wonderful cricketers right on top. I think they've done some reasonably good job. One is Brian Lara, and the other one is Sachin Tendulkar. Or uh, can I say they're all really uh, reasonably okay guys who have done a reasonably good job in cricket? Yeah, I'm sure. Obviously, Sachin is right on top, and Brian is probably just a few notches below, maybe a few steps below, a few millimeters below, perhaps. And if Brian Lara comes to one of us and asks, hey guys, look, I just want your advice a little bit. You are a wonderful human resource community. I just want to improve myself. Uh, you know, I want to be right there as such in Tendulka. Uh, can you tell me what do I need to improve? Probably if I were one of those advisors, I probably might say, hey, the biggest challenge is Sachin is a right-hander. You are a left-hander. You know, that is a big challenge. The moment you start really learning how to play right-hander, you can be perhaps as good as Sachin Tendulkar. And if I will send you for a six-month training program on how to move from left-hander to right-hander. I don't think that is sound advice, ladies and gentlemen. Am I right? Absolutely. Probably the same thing with the guys below. Um, Roger Fedra and Rafael Nadal, who is ambidextrous, whereas Roger Fedra is uh, a really right-handed player. I don't think we can ask him to become ambidextrous. I don't think that is sound advice, definitely true. I'm taking this extreme example of right and left hand to just illustrate a point. One is not good, the other one is not bad. So in real life, it is not about being good or bad. It is about our natural tendencies and differences not only differences, our preferences as well. It's about natural tendencies, the differences we are all, and the consequent differences which lead to our preferences. 
So it's all about natural tendencies, differences, and preferences. I think one of the questions we need to ask all the time is, do you want to change people completely? Do you want to clone people? Do you want to dramatically change people completely to what we want them to be, what you want them to be? Do you want people to just work resolutely on their weaknesses? Many times when we look at performance appraisal, we look at development plan, we are constantly focusing a little more, probably many times more, sometimes in organizations, on, hey, here's your weakness you're going to work on. Here are the things you need to improve. I'm not saying it's not important. Do you want to change people completely? Or do you want people to work only on their weaknesses? Or do you really want people to maximize their strengths, complement with one another, and contribute towards high performance. Do we want people to sharpen their strengths? Do we want them to remove their jagged edges in their strong areas? Do we want to get the best out of their people based on their fabulous strengths? And all of us as individuals do have our strengths. Of course, we all have our weaknesses as well. And I'm going to give a little nice word on these weaknesses shortly from now. So do you want people to maximize their strengths? Because the strengths are already there. How can you make them stronger and stronger and stronger? And therefore we can complement with one another. One looking at the strengths and complement the weakness of someone else. And together with great strengths, they can contribute towards your high performance. Because think about it in real life, that's the real discovery of Dr. Meredith Belby, in my opinion of working with Meredith for over 10 years, is one of the finest discoveries in the human behavior in the last many years. Dr. Meredith Belby says, or in his discovery found, we all have two roles in life, all of us. One is a functional role. Looking at a business HR, after some time, we could become a HR manager looking at compensation. After some time, we can look at HR manager looking at learning and development. Or we can look at HR manager on the strategic side of the business. We can be a sales manager. We can tomorrow become a marketing guy. So we all have our functional roles. And these functional roles keep changing. They must change. They ought to change because that's one way of our growing in our ladder, in the hierarchy, in our performance, in our lives all the time. So we all have our functional roles, but there's another role which is intrinsic to us, which is inside us, and that is a team role. Not just functional role, but a team role. Therefore, that's the great discovery of Meredith what is a team role? Interesting examples of team role are the concept behind a team role. Very simply put, a tendency to behave, contribute, and interrelate with others in a particular way. Some lovely words over here. The word is tendency. And that word tendency really means an inclination a natural inclination, a natural preference. I mean, we all have our natural tendencies. For example, let's look at even a simple thing like having breakfast. I'm sure we all have our natural preferences for a particular dish as breakfast. Somebody says, oh, I like my aloo paratas in the morning, I love it. Somebody says, I like my dosas in the morning. Somebody says, oh, I love the poha in the morning. So we all have our individual preferences in breakfast. Also, there are some dishes somebody will say, hey, no, I don't like it. I just can't have it for breakfast. Unless the next two days, I'm not going to have breakfast. Or I'm not going to have any meal for the next couple of uh, hours or two hours, three hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, whatever. No. And sometimes we can say that 
This is not my favorite dish, but I can live with it. It's okay. I don't mind having it. It isn't too bad, but I can't say love it. So we all have our natural preferences, even a simple thing like a breakfast. Therefore, we all have our natural tendency. Let's look at some of the words very beautifully. Tendency to behave. Let me give a light, little example. Let's say some years ago, when I was in, many, many years ago, many moons earlier, I was in, let's say, first job uh, on a Saturday evening. Uh, I just want to go for a movie. And I called one of my good friends and say, it's about 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the evening. Suddenly a bright idea came to my mind. Why not go to a movie, a picture, a theater? And I called one of my friends and probably go to his house or flat, whatever it is. Uh, hey, let's go for a film. And he's... Probably his response could be, that's a good idea, let's go right now. And we're just getting into the car, the motorbike, and going, and I ask him, what happens if you don't get tickets? Oh, it doesn't matter, we'll see some other movie. So if you don't get any tickets, it's okay, we can have a glass of beer, we can probably have a meal and come back. It's okay, more important is to have some fun. One day of behavior. I go to another friend of mine, and I tell him the same thing, let's say, 6.30, hey, let's go for a film. Wait a minute. What's the time now? It is half past six. What time the movie start? 7.38. What day is today? Saturday. Do you expect on a Saturday, when you leave at 6.30 to reach the theater, the theater is going to open with empty seats for you to welcome you into the theater. They're going to have a red carpet. Forget it. If you want to see a movie on a Saturday, you better plan how many days before? Maybe we can stay. Tell me, friends, which guy I would like to ask for a movie next time? Is it the second or the first? Whenever I ask this question, universally everybody says he's the first guy. Because I like the way he reacts. But both of them in their mind are thinking very strongly, very convincingly that they are contributing. The first guy thinks he's contributing because I want to have some fun. Or he wants to have some fun. Let me join him in for fun. And it's good to have some fun. That's contribution. The second person thinks he's also contributing. This guy doesn't plan. At 6.30 on a bright Saturday evening, he gets a bright idea to go for a theater. And he doesn't realize that he's going to get a movie theater ticket. And we will go there and we will see a lousy movie. And I'm not going to have him pay 300 bucks to get a movie ticket for a lousy movie and have some headache. No way. I'm going to improve him to become a little more better organized. Both think I'm contrib they are contributing. But I believe that only one is contributing. So a tendency to behave, contribute, and relate with each other, relate with one another in a particular way. That is a team role. That's the definition of a team role. So there are two roles, a functional role and a team role. And there are nine team roles, the discovery of merit by what are these nine team roles? And you can see some nice symbols over there. There are nine. And the nine team roles, some are very beautifully fallen, three wonderful buckets, and precisely three each, so nicely. What are those nine team roles? And what kind of buckets do they fall in? First bucket, which is a lovely bucket, is task or action related team roles. These team roles, have a very principal focus of task, action, in the way they behave, in the way they look at things. And the first one is a guy with a whip in the hand, a shaper. A shaper has got some lovely qualities, and you can see the positive qualities right on top. And the second one, weaknesses, which we describe, and Meredith describes it as a lovable weakness. The very word allowable means it's okay to have it. It's not a crime. It's not a personality flaw. It's not a destructive flaw. We all have our weaknesses. Who doesn't have? Challenging, sets challenging goals. Very dynamic. Believes in speed. Goal orientation is very important. Can drive things forward. 
courage to look at things differently, courage to take higher targets and goals, and courage to do what seems to be not easy to do, start with the shape up. In the process, there are associated weaknesses, allowable weaknesses, prone to provocation, and can be blunt and upset people. Somebody probably goes to Schaefer uh, and says that, probably says that, uh, uh, I would like to finish this task, but I've I got a bit of an upset stomach. Wait a minute, as long as there are stomach, some days it will be upset. Let's finish the job first, maybe. Schaefer, task goal, goal driven. You have another person, implementer. The very word is very beautiful. The beauty of Belbin team roles is very affable, very benign, and very simple language to understand. Discipline has an ability to follow a process, game a process and it follows it so well. Organize the way his tables are, the guy who's got a checklist and without a checklist in the evening ticks, I mean, he's just not happy. Efficient, efficiency output by input, turns ideas into action. Give him an idea, tell him there's a way to do that. You can be sure it's done. Challenges sometime. Because of the drive of process, because of being so organized, Sometimes inflexible, any moment away from that disturbs this guy. And therefore, slow to respond, anything which is different, new, and approaching. Not a crime, but an allowable associated weakness as well. And you have another guy, the completer finisher. A very beautiful word, completer finisher. Everything he has to do, he has to do it accurately. Very conscientious, very meticulous, sense of detail, eye for detail, perfectionist doesn't like to put anything which is less than perfect and of course constantly says to himself maybe I, I, I'm still not that perfect I wish I can be a little better. Accurate, conscientious, meticulous, perfect, really sets high standards and keeps improving the standards, refining the standards all the time. Consequently, reluctant to delegate. You know the other guys really, they, they just don't have the sense of detail. I mean they just don't have the sense of accuracy worry and time because there's a high level of anxiety because a complete finisher wants to do the job in time and also wants to do it immaculately so these two are sometimes conflicting and therefore he has a sense of worry and anxiety he doesn't want to compromise on both of course if you're going to choose between the two he will choose doing it accurately but not perfectly on time but that's an anxiety for you goal oriented shaper Process, action, task-driven implementer, and standards high, and really, really conscientious, meticulous, complete finisher. All the three belong to the task-oriented roles. The second side, or the second bucket is people side, the team side, the social side of team roles. The guy with the telephone, the girl with the telephone, resource investigator. Enthusiastic, communicating, Explores opportunities, develops contacts. Get up in the morning at six in the morning, 5.30. I think, you know, even before the cup of coffee or tea, maybe a, 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 a sort of a dose of uh, a Facebook would be wonderful. Really has the ability to find some connection with people anywhere. Can go to a totally new place and he'll find someone who knows him through someone, 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 someone. But the challenge is over optimistic. Therefore, can get a little bored quickly, can be a little impulsive quickly, and therefore can lose it, can flirt between idea to idea, doesn't have the perseverance to do that, but is very persuasive to make things happen. Somebody can walk into completely unknown area and territory and start doing something because he believes he can do that. That's a resource investigator. Ability to connect with people, networking very strong. Resource investigator looks at the world outside his team, his job, his area. A coordinator looks at something within. You can see the symbol, the guy who bears a, who wields a baton in the symphony orchestra. Calm, confident, clarifies goals, but believes strongly in consensus decision making, the joint decision making. Tries to get the best from people, encourages people to contribute, and puts it together nicely as a coordinator. Probably 
you know, he's also task oriented, but the task is through people, through the social side, through the team side, and that's why his team are social related teams. Little flip side, we all have unallowable weaknesses, can be seen as a bit manipulative. The word manipulative here is not about negative intention manipulation. It's about gently steering, and when you steer a wheel, you can be a little manipulative to move it around a little bit. I know you guys must have experienced some time, have a wonderful meeting in your company, participate, everybody participates. When you leave the meeting and come out, somebody might just make a very, 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 very gentle, innocuous remark. Yeah, it was a good meeting. Uh, we all participate. Yeah, but I just got the feeling maybe the decisions were taken a little before itself. So you are gently steering people towards a foregone decision. That's the kind of manipulation, not a negative, illful manipulation, no. And sometimes you wonder what the coordinator is doing uh, because I offload some kind of a personal meeting, personal work, absolutely. You know, sometimes, especially when you watch a symphony, somebody must be wondering, come on, this guy is not playing an instrument, he is not singing, he just has waving his hands, and everybody has got some paper in front of them, and they're doing some work. What's this guy doing? Sometimes a coordinator, we don't know, what, what's he doing? That's a coordinator. But he gets the best of people and puts it all together nicely, and you have this wonderful guy, team worker, like a lubricant in an engine. We notice the lubricant only when it is absent, not when it is present. The engine is heated. The situation is very, very hot. There's a tension palpable in the room. That's a team worker. Cooperative, caring, diplomatic, sensitive, averse friction, believes in harmony. An extremely important guy. You must have seen in your families as well. You know, uh, family function, some little tension, some little discomfort. People are not looking at each other, at least some of them. Here comes this team worker and probably gets a cup of tea meat, talks to people, hugs them a little bit. And within a few minutes time, people are, are smiling a little bit. And at least the eyebrows are a little down, not so high. That's a wonderful team worker. But we see the absence of a team worker more and the presence is sometimes taken for granted. Challenge of a team worker, the allowable weakness. Sometimes indecisive, maybe many times, when faced with tough decisions, because any decision will hurt somebody. How can we do that? You're not going to hurt people. A team worker finds it difficult to be decisive when the need is to be decisive. Resource investigator, coordinator, and a team worker. Third, first we looked at the task sign the team side and really now the thinking side, the brains that work is also individual because it's within. Three very, very unique characteristics, three very powerful team roles. One is a plant. Very interesting word discovery, a nice word crafted and coined by Meredith Belbin, plant. What does it mean applause? It's a symbol. It's a bulb, a light flashing, an idea coming out. A plant is a right brain thinker, creative, imaginative, original, offers or approaches. Absolutely. Can think out of the box dramatically, can turn the problem upside down. The word plant comes from, he has got the ability to plant a new direction, a new thought process, a new idea in the team, which will take them to a completely better, different direction. Of course, not all plants' ideas are great, but you don't know which one is great until you hear all of them. But the challenge of a plant is, many times plant is communicating within himself, preoccupied by thoughts. And a plant can be a bit of a non-conformist because following a rule, following a process, uh, restricts a plant. Very difficult for a plant. And that's the right side of the brain. We can't forget the left side of the brain. You have the strong third eye, the eye in the center, unbiased, discerning, strong monitor, evaluator. Monitors things, evaluates them, unbiased, logical. Believes in facts, decisions based on facts. Loves a bit of an Excel sheet. A plant is a bit of a paintbrush of the Microsoft. He is logical. For him, anything needs to be go through the test of logic. 
pass the test of logic, analytical, loves analysis, discerning, buys what he needs, decides what's right, has a binary thinking, which is sometimes very important, good or bad, right or wrong, beautiful, ugly, yes or no. You can't have wishy-washy in between too many grays. Sometimes too many grays is really disturbing as well. Make decisions based on facts. A modern evaluator who has got the ability to see the negative side of an idea, the negative side of an issue, the negative side of a decision really strongly. What can go wrong? Easily appears in front of the screen of a self-created screen of a monitor evaluator. Flip side, appears slow moving. He is like a hump on the highway, the speed breakers. The shaper wants to drive the organization, the team at a speed, which he thinks is really high speed, but others may be thinking could be reckless and monitor values honestly believe, hey, that's too reckless. I can see big potholes maybe a mile from now. I can see some wonderful humps there, slow down. Appear slow moving. Some time may appear to lack drive or may appear uninspiring because it's facts, it's discerning, it's logical, it's analytical. So it's not, it's not something where I mean, he doesn't use words like fantastic, doesn't use easily words that don't come to him easily. Oh, that's fabulous. No, probably serve a nice meal to him. He might say, good. Good. How's the meal? Good. You mean only good? What do you mean by only good? It's good. What more you want me to say? That's a bunch of evaluator. Plant is right. And bunch of evaluator left side of the brain. There's a third one which you might be discovered as the ninth team role, a specialist. It's not about a functional specialization. It's about the specialization orientation of the mind. The word specialist means getting down to depth. Therefore, single-minded towards understanding something very strongly. Wants to get into depth, motivated by the pursuit of knowledge. Knowledge itself is a pursuit for a specialist. And a specialist says, I've just been reading this for the last four years. There's so much more. The more I read, the more I discover, how much more I don't know. But the beauty of a specialist is, is like a blotting paper, absorbs knowledge from outside in a deep way. There are no shortcuts for him. And then he is ready to give out that knowledge when you ask him for that. A specialist is sometimes very essential to provide a great support to your team on some way of looking at things, some performance. Flip side, contributes on a narrow front, dwells on technicalities. Sometimes you may call it not practical, but that's a specialist. Shaper, implementer, carpet finisher. Resource investigator, you have wonderful coordinator, team worker, plant, monitor evaluator, specialist. But the key question is, hey, wait a minute, Ravi, do some of us have only some team roles? No. All of us have got all the nine team roles within each one of us. Every one of us in this webinar, every one of us in this world, in me, we all have all the nine team roles within each one of us. So what's the big difference? The big difference is some of our preferred team roles. If any of you love your alu paratas as a breakfast in the morning, so you will have some alu paratas team roles. That means that you love that natural tendency that comes to you naturally. Some people can really have a natural preference to look at things completely out of the box. Some people have a natural tendency to be quick, fast, and drive things. Some people have a natural tendency to really look at things in a deep, analytical way. We all have our natural differences. Some of our manageable team roles. They are not our natural preferences, but we can handle them. We can bring them forth very nicely. And some are our least preferred team roles. Typically out of nine team roles, most people have two to three preferred team roles. And the last two would be typically least preferred team roles. And the four, roughly the middle, and empirical data is all indicative manageable team roles. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, all of us have got all the nine team roles, but some are preferred, some are manageable, and some are least preferred. I want you to look at this chart. Therefore, 
for what do building assessments actually measure? I want you to have a look at this chart. Take a few seconds and look at what you observe here very carefully. And maybe can I request you to text your observations on this? Right, Hetal says very nicely, based on the personality individual behavior, lovely. Jokhari window personality header, that's Rekhan Sarda, absolutely, great. Can I request you to check for the picture and tell me some observations? Don't even worry about anything else that you know before. Just look at the picture, I'm going to ask you some very silly question. Um, um, is it static? Is it moving? Can you see something on the picture? Just look at the picture. Because this is the heart of Belvin team rooms. What do you see on the picture? What's happening on the picture? What do you observe on the picture happening? Oh, Ravi Kiran says, interesting. Once behavior is anchored by personality, that means the behavior changes, but person remains the same. Very interesting. Thank you. Ketal says it's a floating boat. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Lovely. Rekhan Sardar say the ship feels is moving whereas it is anchored. That's lovely, Rekhan Sardar. Thank you. Can you also look at this personality a little bit more closely? Just keep looking at it. Do you see something interesting? The word personality? Look at the word personality carefully. Can you see something? Look at the picture personality. Can you see something there nicely? Behavior limit by DNA genetics or limitation to change. That's a lovely statement by Naresh. Fabulous. Thank you. Okay, one last question on that. Look at personality. Anything happening on the personality? Look at it very carefully. Maybe just focus on that personality for a few seconds. Is it moving? Yeah, you can see that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes, it's moving. Thank you, Heather, it's moving. I mean, you, you, you have to observe it very carefully. Now, this is a lovely depiction. Let me explain this to you. You have a DNA genetics, which is our anchor. All of us have our anchor in the DNA. We are what we are in your born with. A strong DNA which is an anchor. Anchor doesn't move at all. All of us are anchored in life. Many times when you've got a problem, challenges in life, then some people say, I go back to my family. When I go back home, you know, I feel comfortable. That's anchor for all of us. So it says personality is linked with behavior. Lovely story. So DNA is an anchor. Closest to the DNA with a short rope is personality. The shorter the rope, the less flexible it is. Because when the rope is short connecting two things, the moment is limited because of the length of the rope. Still, the personality can see some slight movement. Now, still connected to the DNA, still connected to personality, but further connected with a longer rope is behavior. The longer the rope, the more flexible it is. And DNA and personality are below the surface. They also go through some environment which is below the sea level. But behavior is above the water level. The water level keeps moving. You have wind, your environment, so many things are linked to it, and therefore. The behavior ship is a little about moving, a little more flexible. Therefore, DNA, personality, and behavior. Belvin assessments measure behavior, not personality. Therefore, behavior is first 
But that is secret. And but that is inside. I did not know. Behavior is observable. And the simplest definition of behavior that I can think of is very simple English language. What you say and what you do is behavior. That's all. It's observable. It is straightforward. I can say it. I can articulate it. I don't have to think about what to say clearly. So it's behavior. Belden measures behavior. And the moment we think of behavior, what are we talking about? Behavior, which is repetitive behavior. We are what we repeatedly do, said Aristotle some centuries ago. In real life, people who know us, people who work with us, will not only spot our repetitive behavior, can also spot our one-off behavior and they will discount it. Simple example, sometimes in a meeting, the boss would normally, you know, it's very, talks a lot and, you know, very friendly. One day, a little quiet, a little quiet. They come out of the meeting and somebody must be talking to somebody else. What happened today? He was rather quiet today, unusual. So even a one-off behavior is noticeable. And like we can observe the behavior of our people who we know well, work closely, others can observe our behavior. And it is a repetitive behavior, which is what we are. Therefore, Belbin measures behavior and self-perception, observer, 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 observer. There are four to six observers who give the assessment. I'm not going to get into discussion of how it happens. That will be for maybe a future webinar. But Belbin looks at behavior, self-perception and observer assessment. Minimum four, maybe you can go up to six, sometimes one or two more also, but not too many. Four to six observers and self combined is my team role profile. The preferred roles, the manageable roles, and the least preferred roles. And who are these observers? People who know me well in workplace. Can it be 360? It can be. Can it be 270? It can be. But important is people who I choose as observers and people who know me well in workplace. Self-perception, observer assessment together creates, using a state-of-the-art software, the Belbin team role profile, which has a huge, huge record on reliability and repeatability and a consistent test as well. Therefore, that's the team role. How does identifying a person's team role helps? When we know the preferences of people, the preferred team roles, the manageable team roles, and the least preferred team roles, how can it help an organization, an individual, a group of people? Could you just take a few seconds and text me some ideas from you, how it can help? 30 seconds, let's have some text coming in. How can identifying a person's team role help in what ways, in what manner, in what opportunities, in what possibilities? Some ideas, please. Some thought process from you guys, other ladies. How will it help? Send in your text messages. Some ideas? Wonderful. Observation and behavior of an individual. How will it help? In what way we can use it? How can it be helpful to us? Oh, yes. That's lovely. Very current. Superb. It helps in assigning him to the right position or role. That's fantastic. Boost morale. Beautiful. Complementing each other. Together better than each team member. Fabulous knowledge. That's great. Absolutely fine. Let me give you some lovely example. I think it comes up very nicely. First of all, it improves self-awareness and therefore personal effectiveness. Because remember, my awareness is better from the view of my observers. And I'll give a simple example. Very few people who lose temper. In fact, the word losing temper is a lovely English. I lose temper. So when do I know I lose temper? I lost it. 
It's only after I lose, I know. If I knew I'm going to lose, I'm not going to lose it. Another lovely expression is falling in love. I only knew when I fell in love, not before. Therefore, others can spot it. I mean, some, some, some couple of months ago, I was talking to uh, a relative of mine. He and his wife were there, all, all the people. And I was asking him, uh, 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 do, uh, did you, do you get angry? And his wife said, don't ask him, ask me. I will know it. Therefore, only others know my behavior. And that adds to my awareness. My own assessment doesn't improve my awareness dramatically. The robustness comes from self and observer, improves personal effectiveness. Mutual trust it fosters an understanding and first protective working relationship. We can complement each other, one another. Lovely said by Naresh. And it can be used for team selection and team building. Many times teams are selected on the basis of availability, not necessarily balancing the team. That's what we're going to end up maybe not shortly with. And the lovely one, somebody said beautifully, Ravi Kiran, helps assigning him to a right position of role, match people to jobs and jobs to people, reshaping the jobs so that people give the best out of that more effectively as well. But is behavior constant? No, it's not constant. Behavior is influenced by, of course, as we said, DNA, personality beautifully. Sometimes, some contribution comes from our mental ability. Our ability also improves the way we look at something and therefore the behavior. Our values and motivations, of course, can influence the behavior. You all know that. Experiences in life, big joy. If one of you bring you have 50 million pounds sterling lottery tomorrow, I'm sure the behavior might change a bit. Or extreme trauma can also change the behavior, possible. External influences, the organization behavior or company culture or a forced influencers or something where it is uh, um, you see someone with a high performance but a very a very aggressive behavior people might even wrongly control oh you need to perform well in a company that has people very aggressive therefore we need to be aggressive as well little bit is okay external influences and one thing is sometimes your particular role makes us learn something and therefore it can influence behavior However, go back to what we said, DNA personality behavior. Does it change 180 degree? The answer is no. And a very lovely expression I would like you to keep in mind. We all change. We do change. We must change. We ought to change. But actually, we change less than we think we can change. Therefore, it's all about looking at the behavior, building the best out of that, and using the behavior very strongly. Therefore, what do we do with development team roles? There are preferred roles, develop and perfect roles. Because in each of the strong roles, as others see and we see, we make up some jagged edges. For example, the beauty of development team roles is one of you can be a shaper with a good set of negative qualities of a shaper, the allowable weaknesses, or somebody can be a shaper with no observed allowable weaknesses. Therefore, each well-being team role profile is very unique to that individual based on those observers. It's very beautiful. Therefore, if I am a shaper and I go to the jagged edges, I become a little confrontational. I become a little impatient. A good advice that I get is, I think if I sharpen these edges a little bit, remove those burrs a little bit, I can be a strong, positive shaper. If I'm a monitor evaluator, logical, unlikely, discerning, but sometimes I tend to be cynical because I see the hard side, the black side, the darkness more strongly. If I'm able to manage that a little bit, I can be a strong monitor evaluator without the weaknesses. Therefore, perfect those roles, plan career to maximum use of these natural strengths. Manageable roles, experiment and develop these roles, be prepared to use when necessary. We can use them, we have the capability, therefore we bring forward these roles. And therefore, understanding the team role helps people to use their team roles in the most effective way and give the best out of themselves and to the team and to the people they work with. Least preferred, I can't use it for long periods of time. But yes, occasionally I may have to bring forth that, but only for the end. 
delegate and pursue activity trading if I am not very strong in analysis in terms of orientation. monetize data. We both that in terms of complementarity and the beauty is build a balanced team. That is the powerful focus of building team roads and therefore this is what I think I am. This is how others see me. This is what I really am. Build up the strengths. Recognize your allowable weaknesses. Respect diversity. If we do that, we unleash the potential of each person by identifying natural talents and attributes. Develop these talents rather than beating around, beating the bush, beating hard on those shortcomings which are going to be extremely difficult unless it's a destructive personality flaw. And then he needs different support altogether. He needs psychiatric help. Wherever possible, reshape jobs. He can reshape, modify a little bit to align the job demands with more natural talents and preferences. Where do we use it? To build a high performance team. Is everything a team or a group? No. People brought together for a common purpose while being too numerous to allow team role relationships to form. That's a group. A team is never formed, a team is selected to work together for a shared objective in a way that allows each person to make a distinctive contribution and all the contributions are needed. The moment you see a limited number of people selected, the very selection process says, hey, wait a minute, how do we select a team? Do we select a team only based on qualifications, based on availability, or can we help them using their team roles to build a distinctive contribution combination? Can we do that very powerfully? The next slide will powerfully illustrate that. You don't need a team everywhere. Any job has got two big dimensions. Complexity of the job, the risk in the job. Sending Mangal Yan into Mars, I think is a highly complex job. It's a high risk, risk of email, risk of money, or risk of reputation of people, da, da, da. If you look at a low complexity, a low risk, all you require is a suitable individual. Very interesting word. There's a great thing you'll see when you look at more and more depth of building. If you look at, again, a low complexity, but a little higher risk, you again need a suitable individual. But the moment the complexity goes a little bit higher, you require a little more talented individual. Qualifications, experience, capability comes into picture. If you go one step beyond, a little more complexity, a little higher risk, you require a collaborative group. If you go still further, High complexity, higher levels, you require a balanced team. When it's a balanced team, people have got talents, but more important, people are suitable to play the various roles, and all the team roles are present, and they're able to understand each other and use it well, a balanced team. Probably Mangalyan requires not just one balanced team, but concurrent balance team and you can see the picture beautifully the same person can be in two teams and one he can play his top role of a plant because that team doesn't have any plants in the other team he can play his second team role let us say for example he is that of a coordinator because that team doesn't have that enough so one can play with his top preferred team role depending upon the team composition that's why it is not separate teams but concurrent balance teams we need to look at this to build high performance team. So what makes an effective team? Representation of the required two roles. We are what we repeatedly do. Relationships that exploit strengths and contain weaknesses. If we work effectively using team roles, we can contain the weaknesses because someone can step in beautifully. And because of someone's natural preference, if only we allow it to happen, that's the last one. Members understand their own and other strengths and weaknesses, and we have the ability to let go, play up, recognize our team roles well, and use the team role as a language of communication, removing the biases about individuals and using it to really value, respect, and get the best out of diversity. What makes an effective team? Questions?
Why do some people with high qualifications fail to attain their full potential? Why do some working relationships end up being less productive? Why do some high performing dashtas fail to make the transition? Bellbin, as you can now see, provides pointers to answers to such and many other similar questions in organizations. Nobody is perfect. None of us. Absolutely no. Maybe God is perfect. But the team can be if only we can build a powerful balanced team where team roles are present, people understand, respect team role, respect diversity, use team role as language, and the team can reach sky as the limit. Thank you very much for your active involvement and participation. Any questions you want, you can ask me now. You can also raise questions later over the mail, and it will be a pleasure to answer questions and help you to discover the strengths of your people, yourself, and see how you can do even better than what you're doing today. Thank you. How to make a balanced team from different groups? A good question, Sumit. Uh, I will answer it for the benefit of everyone and on more information we can write in each other. When you want to get a balanced team, two questions to, you have to ask. One is, what is the team's objective? Is it a team which is in the first stage of the project or is it a regular team in an organization? Once you look at the objectives of the team, then you can decide what kind of team roles are important to make these objectives happen and then do the well-being team role profile of the team members who possibly can be the team members. And once you have them, try to look at the team roles together and see whether all the team roles are present and whether people can play the team roles sufficiently to make sure that all the team roles can come into play. Once you have that, the people should be exposed to understanding team roles, respecting the team roles, and how they can use team role as a language to work together. And if you support this process with them, they can be a very good balanced team with high performance. If one person in the team is underperformer, what is the best approach to remove or retrain? I think it's a very good question, Sumit. Important question to ask is, if one is underperforming, the first question to ask is that, does his natural talents and preferences are in relation to the nature of the job? Is he doing, has he have a natural preference to do certain things which the job demands or he doesn't have? Sometimes I've experienced in life, somebody is not a good performer, you shift him to another job or reshape the job to include elements or remove those elements which are not uh, aligned with his natural preferences. I think he can be a fantastic job. Uh, and I found it very powerfully. That's the first one. And once you do that, you can see whether any competence is required to actually improve his capability. Dushant, could you please clarify the preferred versus least preferred roles? Each one of us, all of us have got all the nine team roles present in us. Except that some are our naturally preferred team roles which we like to play, which are our natural likes. For example, somebody has a natural like to be organized. That means he is a strong he has a natural like to come out with innovative ideas. That means he is a plan. So typically the top two, three roles are our preferred roles and the middle four are approximately our manageable roles. And the last two, we do not have a natural preference. That's why these roles are different. Okay, a uh, lot of questions have come. Uh, how to make team leader work towards his or her goal as if he, she himself is demotivating a team. I think if a leader is demotivating a team, then the challenge would be the leader has probably got many weaknesses in his or her strength. 
I think many times we have found conflicts happen because people do not understand each other uh, and therefore they start blaming. You probably need to do a well-being team role profile for this person and then a good uh, coaching session can help him to bring the best out of himself and remove the jagged edges. How a manager can change I would rather look at the behavior and see does the behavior match with his preferences or our demands are different. And if you can work on his behavior with the right feedback, at some stage very quickly, the change in attitude also takes place. I think it's important. So please look at focusing on the behavior, then start looking at attitude because attitude is inside. Unfortunately, we cannot see it. And many times when we use the word attitude, we may be ascribing a motive to the behavior and call it attitude, and that could be risky. I would rather request you to look at behavior and a conversation based on behavior is more easily understandable, absorbable, and acceptable, and then the attitude change will naturally take place. If there's an existing team, and we have to look at the performance, it's good to do the team role profiles of the people, and then see what is the factor which is causing underperformance. Perhaps the, the team composition is not right, maybe it just needs a bit of a tweaking, or the team composition is fine but they are not using their respective team roles very well and therefore you can still use existing roles and responsibilities and get the team to perform well if only you could help the individual say that hey you can use your manageable team roles a little better so let me tell you how you can use so you can still do that that's a question from Rekhan Shavda how behavior can be changed for negative person um not very easy, but I think first you've got to ask a question, why do you call him negative? What could be the reason? Is it because uh, certain processes are not followed or you had a consistent performance issue? I think it requires a good, good counseling session. After that, you might even arrive at certain change in the job that you need to do or the way the leader works with the individual can also help him to change his negative to positive. At the end of all this, if you try and it doesn't work, then I think you are somebody with a flaw, then he needs a different kind of support to help, which you may be able to give or not so. Thank you, Rekha and Sarda. Any point of time, if any of you have got any more questions, most welcome to do. I would like to end it with just a simple statement. Belbin can change the way we think we work and we live. It is very transformational because it is very affable, it is very benign, and it really helps to look at strengths very strongly rather than the very difficult to improve weaknesses. And in the process, removing those jack digits on the strengths can help people give their very best and the team to perform the very best and individuals perform the very best. We are trying to either load it on YouTube or maybe share the presentation. And I'm also sending you my email ID where you can write to me for any clarifications, sharing of insights, anything, and the pleasure to contribute to your learning and development. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening and have a lovely um, weekend starting the day after tomorrow. Have a lovely time. Thank you so much. Thank you.